Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is December 18, 1976. And this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 19. As our bicentennial year of 1976 draws to a close, the United States of America is in grave danger. Our economy is ravished by the twin plagues of high inflation and high unemployment, a condition which I named stagflation some years ago. Our Republic is under attack and a far advanced plan to bring our country under dictatorship. Our very lives are under the threat of extinction in a surprise nuclear attack which would be the beginning of NUCLEAR WAR ONE. And all of these terrible things have been brought about deliberately by a handful of ruthless, powerful men here and abroad bent on world domination. But how can this be, you ask? How can so few people control the destinies of all the rest of us? After all, it is easy to imagine how far our secret rulers and their henchmen would get if they tried to take over even one city, much less all of America, with their own bare fists and brute force. They would be stopped in their tracks in no time flat because everyone understands that kind of threat, and there are far more of us than there are of them. But those who want to enslave us understand this all too well. They know better than to try any kind of frontal attack on us that would be widely understood. Instead, they have perfected the art of harnessing our own energies so that gradually, step by step, we are enslaving ourselves under their control. The Hegelian principle of thesis, antithesis, synthesis is being applied so as to gradually merge our life with that of the Soviet Union at every level. The average working man and woman in America would never knowingly allow this to happen, and yet it is happening gradually, year after year. The first step, called thesis, is to create and publicize a problem in education, economics, or otherwise in our daily lives. In other words, where there is peace, create discord and trouble. Step 2, antithesis, is to create opposition to the problem. The final step, synthesis is to offer a so-called solution to the problem. This diabolical, roundabout approach psychologically conditions people to accept things which they would otherwise oppose vigorously. Just a look around with this in mind, and you'll see that this technique is being used all around you in a thousand ways. But the real key to the success or failure of this method of manipulating the public lies in something Abraham Lincoln said over 100 years ago, quote, With public sentiment nothing will fail. Without it nothing can succeed, unquote. So long as we, the people, are simply told the truth about things, public sentiment reflects the truth. Under those conditions real solutions can be found for real problems to everyone's benefit, but when we are not told the truth, public sentiment reflects only what we believe, and we can be manipulated into supporting all kinds of things that are not in our best interest. Here in the United States a subtle long-range propaganda technique known simply as misinformation has been used to build up an artificial and false picture of the world and our own nation. In the areas of foreign policy, national security, politics, and economics, the truth has been suppressed and replaced with an elaborate structure of lies, distortions, and half-truths. This false picture has come to be accepted as the truth, with the result that the truth itself has been rendered unbelievable. 
I don't think anyone in his right mind could do what has been done to us. Our education, our Constitution, our free enterprise system, everything possible has been perverted in order to confer ever more power on our secret rulers. Now war is coming. The wars of this century have been fought far from our shores, but this time it is coming here to our land, to our homes, to our people. It will not be a conventional war, but NUCLEAR WAR ONE. As in all modern wars, it will begin with a surprise attack. Thanks to the silence of the United States Government and of the controlled major media, most Americans will be caught completely by surprise believing in a lie called detente until thermonuclear fireballs erupt all around our nation. To show how different the truth is from what we are led to believe by our secret rulers, I will discuss these three topics today. Topic No. 1. Why the United States was not first to launch an Earth satellite. Topic No. 2. Why Most Americans Cannot Believe Nuclear War Is Imminent and Topic No. 3. How the Major Tax-Exempt Foundations Have Cleared the Way for Soviet Nuclear Attack. Topic No. 1. On the evening of October 4, 1957, Americans were stunned by the announcement that the Soviet Union had become the first nation in history to place a man-made satellite in orbit. Sputnik 1, weighing 184 pounds, was circling the Earth every hour and a half, sending out beeps that became famous overnight. The world was thrilled, and the world press heaped great praise on the Soviet Union. They inferred from this accomplishment that the Soviet Socialist System was superior to our own in scientific and technical progress. It was an historical first that can never be undone. The Soviet Union had beaten the United States into space. Less than a month later Sputnik II was launched. It weighed over half a ton and carried the first live passenger into space, a dog. The dog died within a week but it was another startling achievement nonetheless. Meanwhile, poor old America was struggling along, trying to put a tiny 16-pound satellite into orbit by means of the Navy's Vanguard rocket. Two launches were attempted, but both failed. In one case the rocket lifted a few feet off the pad, only to settle back into a tremendous fireball as it exploded. It made exciting footage for the television news that evening. Finally, on January 31, 1958, almost four months after Sputnik 1, America launched its first space satellite from Cape Canaveral, Florida. It was called Explorer 1, and it was launched not by the Navy but by the Army. We were in space at last but only after being thoroughly humiliated before the entire world. After the Sputnik shock, space flight and rockets were suddenly the end thing to be interested in. Even then Senator Lyndon B. Johnson arranged for a new Aeronautics and Space Committee to be set up with himself as its Chairman. He was thereafter as visible as possible in connection with space matters, and today the Manned Space Flight Center in Houston bears his name. At the time I could hardly imagine anything more hypocritical for Johnson to do. Even though I was a lawyer, I had been a member of the then-named American Rocket Society for a number of years and had vivid memories of Johnson's attitude towards space in the early 50's. At that time, four or five years before Sputnik, I was a member of a group headed by Dr. Werner von Braun who approached Johnson in hopes of obtaining support for a space program. 
I will never forget Lyndon Johnson's reaction to the whole idea. He did not merely say no, but jeered at the whole concept as ridiculous and worthless. A few years later the United States was deprived of the chance to be first in space, but not by Lyndon Johnson. What I am going to tell you does not affect our national security now, but it does provide a typical example of what has been happening to America for many years. And as Werner von Braun lies on his deathbed in a hospital near Washington, D.C., I believe the time has come for the truth to be told about why we were not the first to put a satellite into space. In late 1955 or early 1956, the Joint Chiefs of Staff began the first active planning for an American space program. Their goal? To have the United States initiate the world's first successful space flight at the beginning of the International Geophysical Year that was to begin on July 1, 1957. After some controversy as to which service should sponsor the space project, it was concluded that the Army was most capable of doing the job. This was agreed to and approved by the Joint Chiefs and by then Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson. The Army's Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama was fortunate in having the services of the world's foremost rocket expert, Dr. Werner von Braun. From a very early age, von Braun had been fascinated with the idea of space flight, and he had spent his life working with rockets. During World War II, von Braun was pressed into service by Hitler, and the German rocket program was far ahead of other countries by the end of the war. When the war ended, Many of Von Braun's subordinates at the German rocket base were taken prisoner by the Soviet Union, and it was they who were forced to develop and direct the Soviet missile and space programs. But Von Braun himself had resolved well before hostilities ended that he would surrender to the United States, and he succeeded in doing so. Our government then prevailed upon him to intergovernmental research where he would have the money and resources to pursue rocketry in earnest. When the Earth Satellite Project came under consideration years later in the mid-50s, the Joint Staff Project officers interviewed the Redstone Arsenal officials along with Von Braun himself to ascertain their capability. Von Braun stated that his group could engineer a space vehicle and have it ready for orbit in only a few months. The Joint Staff pushed for the Von Braun Project and after it was approved by the Joint Chiefs and Secretary of Defense, it went to President Eisenhower for a final approval and allocation of Defense Department funds, but there it stopped. Strangely, there was a long delay in getting the expected Presidential approval. Finally the word came down to the Joint Staff from the President. Incredibly, they were to disregard the Army's capability and give the space project to the Navy instead. Such a decision was all but unbelievable. The Navy did not even have a blueprint for such a space vehicle. They would be starting almost from scratch. But the decision stood, so several large aircraft companies and Navy scientists gathered to initiate a program called Project Vanguard. As a direct result of this decision, the Soviet Union was able to put Sputnik into orbit while the United States was still struggling unsuccessfully with Vanguard. Joint Staff Project officers were most perplexed about the American political decision to allow the Soviet Union to beat us in this endeavor when we had the capability to be far ahead of them. It appeared to follow a pattern of withholding American capabilities and allowing the Soviet Union the advantage. Later, an aide to President Eisenhower explained confidentially what had transpired. A select group of scientists and financial leaders got wind of the American Space Satellite plans at an early stage. The group, headed by a man who was later awarded the Lenin Peace Prize by the Soviet Union, 
went to the President and pressed him to sponsor a purely American space project with only Native Americans working on it. They didn't want by any means for a former German such as Werner von Braun to give the world and future historians the impression that the Germans of all people were superior in the field of space science. This group, who were actually doing the bidding of the Rockefellers on behalf of their Soviet allies, were instrumental in forcing America to take a back seat in the early years of the Space Age when we were fully capable of being supreme. Finally, after two Soviet Sputniks and two humiliating Navy Vanguard failures, Eisenhower became exasperated and told the Defense Department to get Von Braun into action. Just six weeks after he received the go-ahead, Von Braun's Army team launched Explorer 1. He did exactly what he had said he could do two years earlier and the very first time he tried it. But the special place in history he so richly deserved had been denied him forever, just as it had been denied to the new homeland of his choice, the United States of America. The anti-German argument that had been used on President Eisenhower was, of course, a total fraud. When Sputnik 1 was launched a short dozen years after World War II, the Soviet rocket program was even more dependent on the efforts of captured German scientists than was true in the United States. Thus only one thing was really accomplished by delaying the Army satellite effort under Werner von Braun a tremendous propaganda coup for the Soviet Union, and a setback to American prestige and self-confidence that persisted for years. It is a grim fact that accolades go to the spoilers and traitors among us, but no acclaim to our true heroes and men dedicated to American principles. Under the enthusiastic leadership of Werner von Braun, the United States was able to come from behind to win the race to the moon, but soon the world press will have relegated him to the footnotes of modern history. Like General Douglas MacArthur, Werner von Braun will just fade away. Topic No. 2 When Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger was fired by President Ford, just over a year ago in November 1975 he said, quote, Some years from now someone will say, Why weren't we warned? And I wanted to be able to say, Indeed you were, unquote. But most Americans, when reminded of this parting statement by Schlesinger, tend to be surprised. It is as if his words had gone out into thin air leaving no lasting impression at all. This is a perfect illustration of the way in which the American public had been left comfortably asleep by the controlled major media of our country, oblivious to the steadily mounting threat of war. Around the world the alarms of impending nuclear disaster are jangling louder and louder, but these alarms are muted, muffled, and silenced by the time they reach you. When isolated facts about American or Soviet military developments are reported, it is done in such a way that it has little lasting impact on most people. Thus, for example, you may hear a news item concerning the debate over the new B-1 bomber which the United States Air Force is developing. Taken in isolation, you may well wonder what all the shouting is about and for that matter why such a new bomber is even being considered in this age of missiles. Or you may hear a brief news item mentioning that the Air Force wants to buy some F-15 fighters to augment our air defense system. Perhaps these things would make a little more sense to you if you knew that the Soviet backfire bomber began to be deployed operationally over three years ago. The backfire is a supersonic, long-range bomber capable of delivering nuclear weapons to targets here in the United States 
And that, my friends, is precisely its purpose, not the so-called peripheral missions mentioned by some. Knowing this, perhaps it would have struck you as a little strange that in 1974, after the Soviet backfire bomber began being deployed, the United States virtually dismantled its air defense system. At the very time that a renewed Soviet bomber threat was developing, our network of interceptors was reduced to just six active Air Force squadrons, plus six more in the Air National Guard. The extensive network of Nike Hercules anti-aircraft missiles under Army command was shut down completely. But now, with war threatening to break out, the Defense Department is reversing its position on air defense without telling you why. The mounting controversy over the relative military strength of the Soviet Union and the United States has taken many people by surprise. Almost three and a half years ago the warning was sounded that the Soviet Navy had become stronger than the United States Navy. That's what the world's foremost naval authority, Jane's Fighting Ships, said in July 1973. But if you saw this reported at all by the major media, did it make any impression? Or consider the matter of long-range ballistic missiles. Over four years ago, on November 27, 1972, the Soviet Union successfully test-fired a submarine-launched ballistic missile with a range of 4,500 miles. By comparison, the most advanced American sub-launched missiles have a range of less than 3,000 miles. In addition, the development of a whole new series of Soviet missiles was underway. Early this month the Soviet Union began a 20-day period of tests of the new submarine-launched SSNX-18 ballistic missile, firing them into Circular Zone 100 miles in radius in the North Pacific, southeast of the Aleutian Islands. The SSNX-18 now has a multiple warhead capability, and these tests, which are full operational tests, extend over the full range of the missile which is now more than 5,000 miles. Particular attention is being given to warhead performance in these test-proving flights. If all goes as planned, the SSNX-18 will be committed to full production and operational status within a year's time. The SSNX-18 will give the Soviet Union a commanding lead over the United States in the realm of submarine-launched ballistic missiles. But what have you learned from network news reports or other major media about this missile? Practically nothing. But the most tortured reasoning I have seen yet appeared on December 6, 1976 in the New York Times, an editorial on that date entitled, Moscow's Submarine Merv, begins with the incredible words, and I quote, the Soviet Union's first successful test of a submarine-launched ballistic missile armed with MIR multiple nuclear warheads is good news, paradoxically, for the United States and the world." Unquote. The editorial then argues, in effect, that since this will eliminate the one remaining missile advantage held by the United States, it opens the door for the Soviet Union to make concessions and salt negotiations that could prevent either side from acquiring a first-strike capability. Such Alice in Wonderland reasoning may still serve the purpose of lulling millions of Americans back to sleep, but it would not sit well these days with most NATO defense ministers. For the first time many officials in NATO are genuinely alarmed by the continuing relentless buildup of Soviet power in Europe where the best Soviet troops are concentrated. For example, consider Denmark, which sits astride the channels which lead from the Baltic Sea to the North Sea. Soviet activity in the Baltic has grown more and more ominous of late. Early in September a Soviet task force suddenly materialized off the southeast coast of Denmark, then left, 
then reappeared. All kinds of Soviet naval war games are now being carried out practically on Denmark's doorsteps, so close that they could suddenly turn into an attack that would give practically no warning. Danish Foreign Minister K. B. Anderson said recently, I'm astonished at what is going on. This is completely contrary to the expectations created by the Helsinki Agreement." Unquote. And yet our kept press would have you believe that the new Soviet SSNX-18 missile I just told you about is unimportant or even good news because of possible agreements the Soviet Union might make about it. At the NATO Defense Minister's meeting in Brussels earlier this month, Admiral Sir Peter Hill Norton of Britain warned that the trend of the military balance between East and West is continuing to move in favor of the Soviet bloc. He declared that more money and better planning are needed if NATO is to match what he called the relentless determination of the Warsaw Pact countries to achieve military superiority. He warned that NATO can no longer rely indefinitely upon the superiority of Western technology because massive Soviet spending on research and development have resulted in vast improvements in Soviet weapons. As Dutch Defense Minister Verdeling said on December 8, the day after Sir Peter's speech, quote, the situation as far as the balance of forces worldwide is more serious than many people think, unquote. And there are many other examples of genuine alarm at the vulnerability of Western Europe to a devastating surprise attack. What did Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, who was and is a CIA operative, have to say to the NATO Ministers. He gave a brief nod to the widespread concern over the Soviet buildup, but what you heard reported in the news emphasized the following, and I quote, I think the Alliance is healthy. I leave my post as Secretary of Defense next month with a good deal of optimism about the Atlantic Alliance, the fact that it survived some 26 years, the fact that it's working. I think reasonably smoothly at the present time, frankly reassured by the fact that there is an Atlantic Alliance that it's on watch and doing its job." Unquote. And so, my friends, we can all go back to sleep comfortably reassured. Topic No. 3. One week from today will be Christmas 1976. On that day most Americans will be celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ by giving gifts to one another. The joy of giving is something most everyone understands to a greater or lesser extent. When presents are opened on Christmas Day, for example, parents of small children usually get their greatest fun out of watching their children open presents, not from opening their own gifts. In the same vein, people usually feel good about it when they give a portion of what they have to help others or to support a worthy cause. This is the foundation of what is known as charity. But unfortunately, there are always a very few among us who are motivated not by a spirit of sharing but by runaway greed. Their only pleasure in life comes from amassing more and more of this world's wealth for their own coffers and extending their power to control the wealth of others as well. Ultimately, those who are motivated this way reach the point where they have so much wealth and so much power that it is no longer enough just to add to it just still further. The only thing left in life for those who have acquired wealth and power through greed is to use that power and that wealth to play with the lives and destinies of people. In short, they try to play God. You may ask, why would the Soviet Union go to war? Would the super wealth of America want to create a dictatorship here with themselves in control? You might as well ask, why does the mountain climber want to climb the highest mountain? 
common answer is because it's there. Just like the United States, the richest country in the world is there. What a prize! Early in this century a systematic long-range program was begun by a small group of immensely powerful people. The goal of this program was to acquire ever greater control over American society. This was to lead ultimately to America's merging into a one-world government with themselves and their heirs in control. The method by which this would be accomplished was the dismantling of the basic structure of American society and its reconstruction in the image desired by those who had decided to play God. And to carry out this long-range program, powerful tax-free foundations were established, and given the halo of philanthropy, they were explained to the public as simply a special means the wealthy had devised for giving to the public at large. Each foundation was thus given the image of an institutional Santa Claus. Instead of questioning what they did, the American people was led to accept their activities in the confident belief that they were just showering wonderful gifts on our society day in and day out. This is the picture that is still accepted as a truth by most Americans. They believe it just as fervently as millions of small children believe in Santa Claus. The raw truth about this network of foundations may therefore sound unbelievable just as it sounds unbelievable to a small child if he is told there is no Santa Claus. For months now I have been referring to the role that has been played by these foundations in undermining American society and placing us in the extreme peril we now face. Now I have been given permission to reveal one of my primary sources of information about these foundations and to repeat for you his own words about them. He is my friend Mr. Norman Dodd. Mr. Dodd was Director of Research of the Special Committee of the United States House of Representatives to investigate tax-exempt foundations in 1953 and 1954. The late Congressman Carol Reese of Tennessee was Chairman of this very important committee. Recently Mr. Dodd gave a rare speech here in Washington, D.C., and he has given permission to repeat it here for you. I will now be quoting him. This is not going to be a speech. This is a sharing of ideas born of experience, and I'd like to begin by qualifying myself in your minds. I am a product of a strange type of education and schooling. The education of which I am a product featured the importance of the question, Why?, and then went on to try to instill in us the importance of the question plus our responsibility as individuals to find the answers. I happen to have taken this education and schooling seriously, and I have lived accordingly. In this schooling to which I was subjected, great stress was laid upon the history of this country to illustrate the feature I have just mentioned. As a result, I participated in and was witness to something in the nature of a discovery which was that in the two hundred years of our history many more truths made themselves self-evident than motivated our Founding Fathers. One of these truths bear heavily upon the experiences that I shall recite to you. The truth, were it to be put in words, would read something like this. I'll repeat it slowly because it is quite significant and deserving of considerable thought. The condition or state of the members of any nation at any given time reflects the use to which the wealth they have produced is being put by others than the ones who played a part in its production. That brings me to two experiences which I will describe to you. 
The first was my response to an invitation from the President of the Ford Foundation in his offices in New York. His name? Roland Gaither. Upon arriving there I was greeted with the following, Mr. Dodd, we invited you to come because we thought that perhaps, off the record, you would be kind enough to tell us why the Congress is interested in the operations of foundations such as ourselves. Before I could think how best to reply, he volunteered this. Mr. Dodd, we operate here under directives which emanate from the White House. Would you like to know what the substance of these directives is? My answer was, Yes, Mr. Gaither, I would like very much to know. Whereupon he said, The substance of the directives under which we operate is that we shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. Needless to say, I nearly fell off the chair. As soon as I could recover myself to reply, I said, Mr. Gaither, legally you are entitled to use your grant-making power for this purpose but I don't think you are entitled to withhold this information from the American people to whom you are beholden for your tax exemption. So why do you not tell the American people what you have just told me? His answer was, Mr. Dodd, we would not think of doing that. That was one experience that was very informative. It was incredible. Nevertheless, it is the truth. The next experience involved the acceptance of an invitation from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. This invitation came in response to a letter which I had written the Endowment asking a few pertinent questions. By pertinent, I mean that they related to the effort of the Congress to determine if foundations were engaged in what the Congress said could be un-American activities without defining un-American. I arrived at the office of Dr. Joseph Johnson, who was then President of the Endowment. He was the successor to Alger Hiss. Present were two Vice Presidents, relatively new men, and counsel, a partner in the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. After amenities, Dr. Johnson opened the conversation this way, Mr. Dodd, we have received your letter. We can answer the questions, but it will be a great deal of trouble. The reason for its being a great deal of trouble is that with the ratification by the Senate of the United Nations Treaty, our task was done, and so we bundled up everything in the way of records and sent them to the warehouse and adopted a policy of constructing a building across the street from the United Nations which will serve as a facility for the benefit of those many organizations which from this point on will be bound to follow the activities of the United Nations. So we have a counter-suggestion which is as follows. If you can spare a member of your staff and send him to New York for two weeks, we'll provide a room in our library and also make available to him the minute books of this corporation from its inception. My first reaction was that he had lost his mind. I had some suspicion of what these minute books might well contain, but here was counsel, and there seemed to be no disagreement on the part of the Vice Presidents, and all of them were relatively young, so my guess was that none of them had ever read the minutes themselves. As a result, I accepted the invitation and did send a member of my staff to New York. That member brought back to me on dictaphone belts the following. We are now back to roughly 1908 when the trustees raised a question asking themselves, Is there any way known to man more effective than war, assuming they wish to alter the life of an entire people? They discussed this question academically and in a scholarly fashion for almost a year and came up with the conclusion that war is the most effective means known to man assuming that objective. Then they raise question number two. How do we involve the United States in a war? 
This was in 1909. I doubt if there was any subject more removed from the minds of the people in this country at that time than the possibility of involvement in war. There were intermittent shows, you will remember, in the Balkans, and my guess is that not many people in the country even knew where the Balkans were. They answered the question this way, We must control the diplomatic machinery of the United States. That brings up question No. 3, which is, How do we secure control of the diplomatic machinery of the United States? And the answer comes up, we must control the State Department. That fits in with prior findings which we had uncovered, namely that the hand of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace inside the State Department was a fact. Finally, we are in a war. These trustees have the brashness to congratulate themselves on the wisdom and validity of their original decision because already the impact of our participation in World War I has indicated its capacity to alter our national life. They even go so far as to word and dispatch a telegram to President Wilson, pressuring him to see to it that the war does not end too quickly. Finally the war is over. The trustees then take up the problem which they face, namely, of preventing, as they put it, a reversion of life in the United States of what it was prior to 1914. They came up with the conclusion that to gain that end we must control education in the United States. They realize this is a prodigious piece of work, so they seek and obtain the assistance of the Rockefeller Foundation. They then divide the task into parts, giving to the Rockefeller Foundation the responsibility of altering education as it pertains to domestic subjects. They retain for themselves the task of altering our education as it pertains to subjects bearing on our international relationships. They then decide together that the key to this is an alteration in the teaching of American history. So they approached three of the then existing prominent historians with the proposition that they alter the manner in which, up to then, they had presented the subject. They are all turned down flat. They then decide that it is necessary for them to build their own stable of historians. They approach the Guggenheim Foundation, which specializes in the awarding of fellowships, and suggest when we discover a likely young person who is studying and looking forward to becoming a teacher of history, we will take him to London to pursue his studies. So they take twenty to London, and these twenty are briefed in what is expected of them. These twenty return and eventually become the most active influence in the American Historical Society. This coincides with the appearance, which perhaps you will remember, of book after book, the contents of which cast aspersion on the founders of this country, cast aspersion on the ideas which prompted the founding of this country, and relegates them to the realm of myth. Finally, toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants the American Historical Society $400,000 for the sole purpose of rendering a report as to what the future of this country promises to be and should be. This appears in seven volumes. The seventh volume, of course, summarizes the contents of the other six, and it ends on this note. The future belongs to collectivism, administered with characteristic American humanitarianism and efficiency. Well. In a sense, this was the whole story written down, and Mr. Reese, who was Chairman of the investigation, the last investigation of foundations, hoped to be able to accomplish this. He was not able to do this owing to the disinterest on the part of the Committee's Council and the violent activities of one of its members. I might mention that that member whose activities barred the way was none other than Wayne Hayes, who has come to the end of his career, 
although this marked the start of it." End of quote. Mr. Dodd concluded his talk with some additional comments which I want to save for another discussion, since they go beyond the subject of foundations alone. But you may want to replay what I have just recited from his speech, noting carefully how different the truth is from appearances. And remember, the truth has many enemies. And so it is that the 20th century has been an unparalleled era of increasingly destructive warfare, violence, and terror on a worldwide scale. By pursuing with relentless determination the goal of merging the United States into one world government, the trustees of the key group of major foundations have brought us to the threshold of Nuclear War I to be waged primarily on American soil. As I first revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 from May 1976, some of the present-day trustees of these foundations have been awakening to the threat of a Soviet double-cross in the grand plan for world domination, and last summer this double-cross got underway with the planning of short-range underwater-launched nuclear missiles within the territorial waters of the United States, as well as of many other countries. But the worldwide economic and political empire that is today presided over by the four Rockefeller brothers is so huge that it includes many individuals who still do not believe that any Soviet double-cross will take place, much less that it is already underway. For example, last month I reported that 18 Soviet submarines were deployed along our west coast preparing to inject plutonium particles into the air on November 20, 1976. And our own EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was cooperating by telling us that on that date a radioactive cloud from a Chinese atomic test would begin passing over our west coast, when actually the radioactive cloud from China had not yet left China's own borders. By interesting coincidence, Russell Train, the head of the EPA, arrived in a presumably safe location, Moscow, on November 19, the day before the plutonium was to be released by the Soviet subs. With appropriate irony, he arrived there as head of the United States delegation to the Soviet-American Commission for cooperation in environmental protection. Can you imagine? The plutonium was released by the subs as scheduled on November 20, but just as happened when this was done the first time in early October, unusual weather conditions kept the United States from being badly contaminated. The plutonium cloud drifted across the upper part of the United States and had little effect at ground level. But, my friends, the Soviets never give up. Five days ago on December 13, I learned that Soviet submarines were lining up along the northwest coast of the United States for the third time for this purpose. This time there are 21 submarines loaded with plutonium poison to inject into our atmosphere. According to my latest intelligence sources, 16 are deployed along the coast from Seattle, Washington to Eugene, Oregon, while five more lie between Eugene and Eureka, California. All of these are within 20 miles of the shoreline. I've already explained in detail the connection between this radioactive chemical warfare and the swine flu hoax being perpetrated by the United States Government, particularly in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 17. Therefore, it is significant that the so-called swine flu inoculation program was halted with great publicity two days ago owing to death and paralysis suffered by many who have taken the vaccine. This serves to focus the nation's attention once again on the terrible threat swine flu is said to be, 
Just at a time when the Soviet submarines are once again prepared to inject a poison into our atmosphere that can produce severe flu-like symptoms. It may be that, as was done the past two times, the Soviet submarines will wait for another announcement from the United States Government that it will serve as a cover story such as a Chinese nuclear test before releasing the plutonium into our air. But now they have acquired some experience, and it is possible that they will release the plutonium at any time. Meanwhile, the build-up for war continues. While the mounting Soviet threat to Europe is fraying the nerves of NATO Defense Ministers, the most immediate threat to Europe is once again emerging in the Middle East. In my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 over a year ago, I revealed the overall plan that existed at that time for war to begin in the Middle East. I ask you now to listen to that AUDIO LETTER No. 6 again. All is nearly ready once again for the long-planned war in the Middle East to be ignited. The Rockefeller oil interests now have gotten most of their money out of the Arab region now that title to all the oil fields have been sold to the Arabs themselves. The Middle East war will also leave the United States in an even more defenseless position that we are now in if the Soviet surprise attack on our country is allowed to take place. Last month I explained in detail why the underwater missiles that are being planted along our shores by the Soviet Union are so crucial to them in their plan to defeat the United States in NUCLEAR WAR ONE. But I also explain that they are no longer being removed by the United States Navy. Since I recorded that tape, 57 more nuclear missiles have been planted in our own territorial waters. Added to the 36 I mentioned last month, this brings the total to 93 Soviet missiles in the waters of the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. In addition, four missiles still threaten the Panama Canal, and five more missiles now threaten Canada. I declared last month that I would no longer reveal the locations of these missiles unless and until responsible arrangements are made to inform the public of the deadly threat we are under. Our secret rulers had been using my information from October 1st onward only for their own benefit, and that is not what it is for. I intend to continue to hold my silence until action is taken for everyone's benefit. Nevertheless, I'm going to make one exception at this time. It involves Hawaii. World War II began with a devastating surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, and now no less than nine Soviet underwater missiles now threaten Pearl Harbor and the island of Oahu with the same fate a second time. I will now give the coordinates for these nine missiles only in hopes that this time action will be taken to protect the United States Pacific Fleet from the attack that could come at any moment. These coordinates are Missile No. 1, 21 degrees 13 minutes 47 seconds north, 157 degrees 46 minutes 28 seconds west. Missile No. 2, 21, 18, 37 north. 157, 57, 21 West. Number 3, 21, 17, 31 North. 158, 4, 17 West. Number 4, 21, 21, 19 North. 158, 9, 7 West. Number 5, 21, 36, 12 North. 158, 12, 48 West. Number 6, 21, 36, 33 North. 158, 11, 6 West. Number 7, 21, 26, 54 North. 
157 West. Number 8, 21 19 27 North, 157 38 36 West. And number 9, about 25 miles east of Oahu and 8 miles north of Molokai, at 21 21 13 North, 157 15 26 West. I continue to hope, my friends, that a war can still be prevented. To find out what you can do in the event war does come, I suggest you read Issue 135 of McKeever's Multinational Investment and in Survival Letter, 1012 Russell Street, Baltimore, Maryland, Zip 21230. But my prayer is that you will never need that kind of information. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.